my big idea that I would like to share with all of you today, uh, which is also shared by my partners from Simsar.net, and it's a large team of three that is making, making all of this possible, is about how do we empower individuals in, so that's you know, uh, individuals, business owners, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, small to medium sized enterprises, and policymakers. How do we empower them in this rapidly developing region of the Middle East and other developing countries? How do we empower them with data and tools to be able to make knowledge based decisions uh, in their day to day lives? We also believe that this is extremely important, not just for the region within our site, but for the whole world as these regions start becoming part of this flatter world and become bigger players in the consumer markets, right? So diving right in, how many of you know the uh, cliche or the statement, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing? By the way, when I ask questions, I actually want to see responses, raises of hands, and sort of you know, dancing around, however you want to represent yourself. How many people know that statement, yeah? Okay, all of you, wouldn't you also agree we're already at too much of a good thing, yeah? Not enough nodding. How many of you would sort of agree when, how many of you face that dilemma or find yourself asking, I can't choose, there's just too much to choose from. I don't know what to buy. I, I wish I could buy both of them, right? I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads at this point. Okay, good. Uh, doing some polls. How many of you in the recent past or maybe in the next couple of months might be interested or have bought a phone or a camera? Yeah, good. Was it difficult, especially in our region? How do I choose? A lot of people now, okay, very exciting. Uh, what about people who are about to go and buy a phone? Yeah, okay, I'm seeing a few people that are raising their hands that have said, I have a phone and I'm gonna buy a phone. <laughs> okay. That's how difficult it is. I hope that's not happening with cars. But how many people in the use, you know, are looking for used cars currently? Good, good, I like that. How many people are actually, have bought a used car in the recent past? More hands. Wow, some people are actually raising their hands twice. That's interesting. Some students are raising their hands twice. That's even more interesting. But my point is that um, it's interesting how in this market now, in today's world, we have so many choices. And it's difficult in our region of how to choose these things. Where is the tools and the data that is available to help us make informed decisions? This is uh, numbers from the World Bank carried out, in, uh, research carried out in 2009. I'm just gonna highlight where MENA stands from compared to all other countries. So this problem is magnified in our region where we find ourselves even more limited in our ability to make knowledge-based decisions. And in our region, gut instinct seems to be the best asset in planning ahead. How many business folks in our audience? How many of you will agree? In your day-to-day -day lives in the business world, you're sort of, okay, good, a few nodding heads. So this sort of highlights what the problem is. Now there is a lot of awareness uh, about this fact and huge efforts are being made to improve the situation. For example, Qatar's National Vision 2030 is you know, a huge step forward towards the right, right direction. Now our team at Simsar.net believes that this direction has to have certain key criteria in place to be effective. And that is, one, to be, you know, this knowledge base uh, has to be developed dynamically in the real time in, in the markets. What that means is somebody cannot come in from outside and sort of generate a report and say, here you go. This has to be developed by the market, in the market. Good, I'm seeing some nodding heads. Number two, it has to be developed by the collective community, by the people who day-to-day -day interact in these markets. Again, what that means is you can't call an outsider an expert. You can not call in sort of an auditor and they will again generate your report and say, I'll see you in five more years when you're ready to give me a couple more million. Right? Number three, what this, the above two points together, we believe that technology and tools have to be developed with those two points in mind. And hence, they have to be available at the end point to make all of this possible. Right? So anyway, now what I want to do is I want to take all of the audience through an activity. So I want you all to do this with me. Share with your you know, neighbors about what your choices are. I saw a lot of raises of hands when we were talking about cars. Can everybody relate to cars? Yes? Okay, good. So we're gonna basically say this circle is your choice of car. Some people might be interested in sports cars. Some people might be interested in motorbikes, which is not a car, but anyway. Some people might be interested in uh, trucks, maybe family cars. Make that circle basically your type of car. Agreed? I'm not seeing enough yeses. Yes, yes there we go, okay. Your car probably has a color, hopefully, okay? 
So tell your neighbors what sort of color you're picking, right? And we're going to dumb this problem down considerably. We're going to put a yellow A for I'm picking orange for my color. We're going to put a yellow A for basically all the other things. Maybe you're, you have a certain idea about what sort of horsepower your car comes in. Maybe some of you have a certain price range. Maybe some of you, because you're buying a used car, have a certain interest of a threshold. Only this many miles, please. Maybe you are interested in a certain amount of warranty. Two years, three years. Or I don't care about warranty. I'm going to destroy it anyway. Right? So I'm going to dumb the problem down. We're just going to call it A. And now we step into the market. Highly, well, at least when I, and I've done this a few times now, buying used cars. Again, too much opportunity. Uh, and you know, when you walk through it, I'm lazy in the beginning. I just ask around. I look at magazines, newspapers. And I usually never find what I'm looking for. Yeah? And then you move into the rest of the market. And you're experiencing this poor guy's journey. And you're out there. Can you find the orange? Can you find, who can find the orange A with the alpha in there? Other people from the past? OK, good. For those of you who do not believe it's there, it is there. Yeah? Whoa. And, um, <laughs> and the, but the sad part is, this is what the journey looks like for most of us. Yes? How many of you have tried to navigate the labyrinth that is Salva Road? Oh my god. The, oh yeah, there we go. All right? So this is the reality of the journey. And highly likely, this is not the whole market. I made finding Mr. A here very easy. Highly likely, this is the real market. And I will show you that to be the reality. I also want to ask the business folks in our audience, because there's a lot of them, and only because I knew that did I actually plan this slide. No, I want to ask you, how do you plan? Where are you going? And how do you actually impact that direction? Right? Think about that question. And now, this point, I want to do this sort of theoretical, theoretical exercise. This point represents the now. This is your current moment in time. And for any, any business person, what is our day-to-day -day task? It is to set, to control, and maintain our directions going forward, which is the future. And there are many possible choices to be made. For example, come the end of the fiscal year, what resources do we allocate and where? How do we decide where to allocate budget in an urgent situation? Right? How do you decide about employee performance, resource allocation, joint ventures, mergers and acquisitions? A lot of these are happening more recently in our region. How do you make these decisions? And in today's business environment, especially in our region, the cost of wrong decisions is becoming more and more expensive. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah? Good. So how do you solve this problem? Our team believes that the past is a strong ally in our questions about the future. And knowing this past allows us to predict, plan, and then hopefully impact the future. So what is this past? These are lessons learned experiences, mistakes that we might have made, right? research, feasibility studies, and all this. In a nutshell, it's relevant data. But our team goes and explores this further. What does that mean? What is relevant data? Where does it need to be? How, all those questions are asked. So our belief is, again, based on those three principles that we stated earlier. It is, do the right people collect the relevant data? And is it in the markets, or is it somebody just coming in there and sort of doing you know, a study or something? Is it constant? Is it ubiquitous? That's relevancy for us. But that's not enough, because data alone is useless. And, and the words of, uh, I think, Bill Lodo, who was a TED 2009 speaker, who said, there's no inherent meaning in information. It's what we do in, with information that matters. And after I saw that TED talk, I said, I, I, tools. That's what we have to do. No, I'm kidding. So we decided, basically, you know, that only together with these two things can we actually create effective decisions. So hopefully, by now, you guys will appreciate that there's a boundary. There's a boundary in how we, in our region right now, how do we make decisions as consumers, as business people, right? And we are sort of the new wild, wild east. That's how we make decisions. Gone is the wild, wild west. We're now the new wild, wild east. But we need to change that. And our belief is, and the boundary that we need to break is, that decisions need to be made by arming people with data and tools. So the question is how? And how are we going to do it in our region? So now, I want to take you through the next step of my talk, which is to show you how Samsar.net basically solved the problem for consumers using technology. And we found, our observation showed, by solving this problem for consumers, you create the solution for the business owners. And after that, I want to show you a glimpse of that future, of what this enables. This is what 
you know, our tool, it's a website, basically allows you to see. Here you can see about 1,700 mark, uh, 1700 markets, 1,700 cars available in the Carson Tatar's market alone in one day. This was, by the way, very early in our beginning. So technology should allow this person. Remember that activity where I showed you that big matrix? 1,700 cars. That exercise of going through that matrix to find that circle yellow A would have been a lot more difficult with 1,700 shapes in there. And our point is technology should enable us to sort of put in our filter. I'm looking for a circle. should be orange in color. And A is all these different things. For example, a person could go ahead and set all these filters. You have some primary filters like body style, price, some nice to haves like the color and so forth. And what that leads to is just five cars out of the 1,700. Technology should help us to do that, not just in the car market, in any market. But there's still a wide variety of prices. And this person might sort of you know, want to compare them next to each other. And here you have a matrix, a comparison of the products right next to each other. Who said, wow? Come by, I have a free gift bag or something. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so you can see the products right next to each other. You've got kilometers driven that are different. You've got, I have no idea what happened there. Can somebody see what's going on here? OK. That was intended. Oh, thank you. Um, no, what is this thing doing? Anyway, whatever. But my point is that's the way you believe consumers should be making decisions. So uh, ignore that, whatever. And, um, but uh, that's not exciting. That's already been done. That's out there, right? These sort of tools exist. It is new for the region. I mean, imagine being able to do that for all sorts of different markets. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads, so I'll move on. The business intelligence side of what we've created is what is exciting, OK? And that is what I want to show you next. But I want to set the scene first. These two photos show two different extreme vendors in the used car market, right? And I want to pick this market, partially because I've already made my slides, but um, <laughs> also because um, the used car market is usually in our country, in our region, thought of as a simpleton market. But I want to show you how important it is even in this market. Here you can see the customer friendly uh, staff. You can see a professional reception desk, front offices. This is cutthroat business. And these two pictures highlight that. These are two different showrooms. Look at how much they segment themselves. They differentiate themselves. These are you know, two or three very different kind of cars compared to these two. right? This is very strategic decisions. How are these guys making these decisions? Unfortunately, this is the reality of the market. It's all paper-based. right? Most of our businesses today, SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprises, are all paper-based. How do we make those decisions? Now I want to show you the portal that we basically developed. This shows the, uh, one of the showrooms that I actually showed you pictures of, the visibility of what the customers are looking at, their interest, the customers' interest for the month of December. They have all these different filters that they can set to, you know, in, in any permutation to find out, to study more deeper in those markets. What is actually going on? And this is January. They can even overlay those d data, and the faint blue line here shows December versus January. The system is smart enough to give them options for quarters if they're looking at four months and so far. Now, October was a very exciting time for us. Here you can see two peaks in the month of October. This is in itself a big step forward. I mean, the fact that this person now knows, wow, I had something uniquely interesting going on in these two weeks. Right now, they can't do that. But our tool now allows them to do that dynamically. So this person might want to explore, well, let's learn more about what's going on in these peaks, and might sort it by Merc uh, Mercedes-Benz. Look at that correlation with that peak. But interestingly enough, that peak has nothing to do with it. So we might, we might want to look at what's going on with this peak and sort it by a different make. And you might observe an even more strict correlation. And our proposal is that if we can enable this learning, we can not create peaks. We can give them the power to learn how did they do it, repeat that, create plateaus. And then they will create higher peaks, right? Knowledge-based decisions. This is another dashboard that we basically created. You can see here how they can sort it by very different levels of permutations, SUVs. And that shrinks the data down. They can look at a certain price range, and it shrinks the data down even further. right? They can even see this data in a pictorial format, and so forth. 
So these are only two very simple examples. But there are much larger implications of what we've crea created beyond business owners utilizing data for knowledge-based decisions. We've humanized the data and breathed life into it, given it a character. And with this new shift in thinking, we can start looking at new possibilities and even new questions for the Middle East and the larger region and any developing country. Being able to play with data in this manner opens the doors to better market stability, a better understanding of consumer needs, and so forth. This is real-time data, which should allow policymakers, researchers, and statistics, you know, statisticians to lead to better infrastructure and urban planning and a better and more effective utilization of public funds. And all of this, of course, is part and parcel towards building a knowledge-based economy. And I want to give you a glimpse of this future. We started collecting our stats from May 2010 and onwards. I want to take you through a journey of what is possible with data, giving it character. I'm only going to look at the top uh, five characters, uh, categories. You can see here a distribution of what customers' interests were, what were they were viewing uh, you know, by cars manufactured in different years in the used car market. And we're going to step through the journey. And as I step through it, I want you to look at how it correlates to when vacations happen, when expats come back into the country, when are expats leaving, what is the impact of economic crises that happened in 2010, what about when the government decreed that all government employees are going to get an you know, increase in salaries. I'm going to step through this journey and look at how it all changes and how there's, you know, when people come in from July, hey, you, the interests suddenly change and expats are more interested in 2009, 2008. This remains consistent throughout the times when people are dormant in the years. And then suddenly when people are leaving, you can see how maybe blue collar workers are leaving here. And suddenly when people are, there's a mass exodus and more cars enter the market. Or maybe this has something to do with Christmas and people buying gifts or stuff, right? But there's so much more possibilities by studying these data now. Not excited enough? Let me do something else. Let me rip the data apart, OK? Let me study two extremes. You've got the family cars versus sports cars. Very different crowds. And as I step through this journey, I want you to think about the differences. Families, what do they do? They buy a car, use it for a certain amount of time, put it back into the market. Sport car enthusiasts, and I was one of them. You buy a car, you have to be always brand new, have to be top of the line, the latest models. And you'll see that trend. Compare the two. Look at that interest. Look at that interest. Look at that interest. And I can keep doing that until December. See? Very exciting. So I hope that was exciting for you. In summary, data and information will enable us in the Middle East and other developing countries towards a real knowledge-based community where real-time modeling and analyses of information allows for inf in, inf informed decision making. Our message is that it is important that these tools and agents are you know, distributed within the community, the collective community, and that they're able to participate, not just for a good you know, cause or anything. They need to provide the data. And you know, we're confident that technology and digital tools at the tips of consumers and business people and policymakers will not just help us towards a knowledge-based economy, but the region is in a very special place. We have the ability with these tools to leapfrog beyond a knowledge-based economy and hopefully build intelligent cities. That's the possibility. Okay? Thank you.